Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 296 of the Mom Hour. I am Sarah Powers, here with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hi, Sarah. Oh my gosh, we're almost at 300. Crazy. I know. We need to plan a party or something. A virtual party. (laughs) Of course, that's the only kind we get to have anymore. We're so all so (laughs) tired of virtual parties. Anyway, for episode 296, we are talking about love languages. This has been a requested topic for some time now. Um, If you're not familiar, the five love languages are kind of a framework for thinking about your relationships. We're going to talk about it with regard to parenting today. Um, And it's a it's a book and a system that's been around for quite some time. And I think we can both kind of touch on our familiarity with it. But the reason I think this makes for a fun podcast episode is unlike personality tests and other kind of frameworks for self-understanding The love languages make for really interesting discussions about how we relate to the people in our homes, how we love them, how they perceive that we love them. So I think this is going to be fun. Yeah, I love this one. And Sarah, we are both big fans of personality tests. But one thing about the love languages that I I love, and it's by an author, it was created by an author named Gary Chapman. Um, There is a book, there's several books now. And also, um, there's like an online quiz you can take and all kinds of different resources. But it's different than the, the kinds of personality tests we often talk about, like Myers-Briggs or Enneagram, because it's just as much about how you express love to others. And I think what's so interesting is if you don't, if you haven't thought about this or given it a lot of thought, you might go around expressing love to everyone in your life the way you want to have love expressed to you. So if like hugs are really important to you, Maybe you hug everyone you love, Mm -hmm. but maybe that's not what matters to them. Maybe what matters to them is that you do stuff for them or that you tell them their love. Like, and, and I don't believe that there's any one that just like, is like the, you know, the magic bullet for everybody. I think we all feel loved in a variety of ways and that's fine. Um, but one or two will usually rise to the top. And I, I just think it's really powerful to understand that it might be different from yours Mm -hmm. and that it's a great way to get closer to other people in your lives, including your kids. Yeah, I totally agree. And I would say in, in doing the reading I've done, I have learned more about the way I show love to other people than I Mm. have used this to understand myself. And maybe that's, maybe that's just me, but I totally agree with you. And this is a good time to say that, you know, there's always like a, a portion of the population that's like, no, I don't like this stuff. I'm not into frameworks or personality tests. And to be honest, I really get that because I, I have that streak in me too, but I'm going to say, stick around for this one, because this is not something you have to like change anything you're doing as a parent. It's not like you're not going to fall down the Enneagram rabbit hole and like, let this take over your life. All we're doing really, I think is giving a vocabulary to the fact that between us, we have eight kids. All of you listening have a number of children in your house, most likely, and they um, express their needs differently and they feel your connection differently. And that is true. That's universally true, whether you want to apply like a, a psychology lens to that or some kind of other framework. So I guess this that my little disclaimer to the skeptics is that you don't have to like you don't have to be into the five love languages, but I do think it's a kind of a portal into talking about really powerful stuff about how our kids perceive the things we do for them and the way that we love them. So totally the agree. rest is just vocabulary. And I think this one gives a particularly interesting vocabulary around that. So I'm excited. I agree. And the other thing I will say is that um, I believe the original five love languages book was written for for couples. Mm-hmm. And if you are constantly feeling disappointed by your partner um, mm-hmm. or spouse, I think it's really very instructive and informative to understand maybe why what they're doing isn't working for you. It, mm-hmm. It's not about like changing anything or like Sarah said, falling down some like really deep <laughs> rabbit hole to like, um, I don't know, analyze yourself. It's more like, why do I feel so disappointed when he brings me flowers when what I really want is for him to, to do the dishes yeah. or something? And I think it's a really 
it's a really interesting um, segue into maybe communicating differently and mm-hmm. understanding each other. And that's also very different from a lot of personality tests. So I agree. It's not, I don't think it's the same. And even if you kind of roll your eyes at Enneagram talk, I think that this one is useful in, in like basically every close relationship you have. Yeah, I agree. So with that, after the break, we're going to just dive right in. You don't have to have heard of this before. We're going to walk through what the five love languages are, talk a little bit about our own, and then transition into kind of how it relates to how we parent our kids. So we'll be right back. We are welcoming back Vionic Shoes today as a sponsor. And oh my goodness, I have a new style I need everyone out there to get right now. So Megan, you know the classic slip-on sneaker style? Oh yeah, I love those. Well, I have never been able to wear that shape of shoe from any brand. They either pinch my toes or they slip off my heels or something. But Vionic sent me the Malibu slip-on style from their beach line and it fits. Like they're comfortable. I am so excited. Oh, those are so cute. I cannot wait for some beach-friendly shoe styles because it's the dead of winter here in Michigan. But lucky for me, Vionic also has a ton of boots and waterproof styles that are super comfortable and keep my feet warm. And all of Vionic styles feature a podiatrist-designed footbed concealed on the inside of the shoe that delivers what they call three-zone comfort. Right. So the three zones are your heel, your arch, and the ball of your foot. And these Vionic footbeds are clinically proven to help with plantar fasciitis and heel pain. But you'd never know they're there because the outside of the shoe is just a super cute modern style. It's pretty brilliant when you think about it. They've got active sneakers, casual sneakers, boots and booties, heels and pumps for the office, and even flip-flops and slippers. And Vionic's 30-day wear test means you can return a pair of shoes for a full refund within 30 days, even if you've worn them outside. Check out VionicShoes.com to see the latest styles and use the promo code THEMOMHOUR for free shipping all year long. Again, it's V-I-O-N-I-C Shoes.com and the promo code THEMOMHOUR will get you free shipping. We are so glad to be working with March of Dimes as a sponsor for today's episode. Megan, this organization does so much for moms and babies and has for so long. January is National Birth Defects Prevention Month, and March of Dimes wants our listeners to have all the resources they need to have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. We know that not all birth defects are preventable, but it's also such a good reminder to look at this list of things moms can do before and during pregnancy to reduce their overall risks and give their baby the best chance at a healthy start in life. And that's things like making a pre-pregnancy checkup with your provider to talk about managing your health conditions, staying up to date on your vaccinations, including the flu shot, and talking to your provider about the timing and necessity of different vaccines for each of your pregnancies. Yeah, I remember that one being kind of tricky to navigate back when I was pregnant and H1N1 vaccines were a big thing. We know COVID has changed a lot about how healthcare works and pregnant moms are going to have a whole bunch of new questions this year. So that's great advice. Another quick tip is to make sure you're getting at least 400 micrograms of folic acid every day. Be sure to check the label on your vitamin bottle to make sure it contains 100% of the daily value of folic acid, which is 400 micrograms. The theme for this year's National Birth Defects Prevention Month is best for you, best for baby. And you can follow the hashtag best for you, best for baby with the number four throughout the month. You can also visit marchofdimes.org slash the mom hour for more tips and resources. Again, that's marchofdimes.org slash the mom hour. Okay, so let's dive in. And Megan, for those who've never heard of this framework, why don't you just tell us what the five love languages are? Okay, so they are physical touch, uh, words of affirmation, quality time, acts of service, and gifts. Okay, so physical touch, words of affirmation, quality time, acts of service, and gifts. And you'll get to know them a little as we talk, but if you read the books and read the articles and stuff, these are both the ways that we show love to other people and the way that we receive love. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Megan, but I think... Most of us have a dominant one or two that we feel most loved in these ways. And then those people around us also have a dominant one or two. But again, just like you said in the opening, the way we're trying to love them may not be the way that they most feel loved. So um, we're both this is both like an internal thing, like what's my love language, but also what how am I showing love to the people around me? So do you know your own? Like, have you taken the quiz like of those five? Which are your top? I have. And I honestly am not sure I've even read the book all the way through. And if I did, it was a long time ago. Um, I took the quiz online and read some articles about it. And I also was not even a little bit surprised. Sure. (laughs) 
by the results for me. So um, I have. And again, like what you're saying, you know, one or two dominant ones, the way the quiz is set up and scored, I don't even think it's possible to have more than two dominant. Um, I can't really think how those numbers would work out. So mine, my two dominant ones are words of affirmation and physical touch. Those are tied. Okay. And then for second, um, quality time mm-hmm. and acts of service. And then gifts come dead last. Like, I don't even think, I don't even think it ranks Interesting. for me. So, I mean, we can dig into that even more, Sarah, but I'm curious, have, have you taken the quiz or like, have you yeah. identified yours? Yeah. yeah. So you and I have some, uh, we're not as opposite as, as we are in some, in some frameworks. In some other ways. We're like, right. Myers-Briggs is the one where it's like, if you turn us inside out, like everything is opposite, but. Right. Um, so my by far dominant one is acts of service, I believe followed by words of affirmation. So my top two are acts of service and words of affirmation. But of those acts of service is like, I can't remember how it's visually shown, but it's a lot. That is the number one way to love me is to help me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and at the very bottom for mine is physical touch was the lowest quality time gifts and physical touch are all kind of lower. Um, but if I remember, um, gifts is pretty low for me too. It's not like you where it doesn't register at all. So we both have gifts fairly low. We both have words of affirmation in our top two, and then everything else is kind of scrambled. Um, and then I guess before we move too far in, let's just say the ones that aren't super obvious. So gifts is a pretty obvious, like if you feel loved when people give you gifts, it might not just be birthday and Christmas, but coming home with a, you know, surprise bouquet of flowers or when your kid draws a picture for you. So all of those things count as gifts. Um, Acts of service are exactly what it sounds like, like when someone folds the laundry without asking or without, you know, needing to be told or takes the garbage out. Um, It's the little things, does something that takes something off your plate um, in a service oriented way. Um, quality time is quality time. Although in reading more about that one, I also understood it to mean really feeling, um, listened to and paid attention to not just Mm. like, so it's not all quality time is just like a date night or, um, a good conversation with a friend. It can also be that when you're on your date or you are having a conversation with your friend that you feel really heard and valued and paid attention to. So like, I guess the key word there is quality. It's not just yeah. the quantity of time, but the quality. Um, words of affirmation are things like, oh, Megan, I so appreciate you. You're the best. You know, I mean, all of the, it's compliments. You're great at your yeah. job. You're so pretty. <laughs> the th- it's the thing. You can always say that to me if you I want. will. I will affirm oh, you. Um, you. And then physical touch, they make a big point. Um, that it's not just intimate physical touch, but just things like, you know, a squeeze of the hand, a pat on the shoulder yes. going by that there are people who feel that or who want that type of love. And it's not just of the intimate sort. So that was like yes. a super fast um, run through in case they weren't obvious. But I do think it's interesting that you and I have um, some, some similarities some and some differences. So what else have you kind of noticed about your love languages before we get into talking about like the kids and the family? Yeah. Well, I, one thing I think is really, um, interesting and important is that like any frameworks, you can always shoot holes in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and because that's what frameworks are there for. They're, they're like rules that are meant to be broken sometimes, I think. And, and one thing I, I've definitely recognized about the, um, love languages. Well, two things actually. One is that sometimes something can kind of cross categories. So like the right gift could feel like an act of service mm-hmm. or physical touch could feel like quality time mm-hmm. or like one thing could kind of like cross categories in a way that I think can kind of make it a little bit confusing. And also there have been times in my life, um, and this could be a real huge variety of factors that would go into this. Um, when I feel more or less secure in a relationship or when my personal needs are just different, sometimes this has been a little more fluid. So for example, I'm thinking back to when um, my kids were really, really little Mm -hmm. and I had like a nursing baby or a nursing toddler. I literally did not want anyone to touch me for a long time. And that was not a thing for me. Like if you had asked me then if I thought physical touch was like my love language, I would have said to you, what are you talking about? Like all I get 
mm-hmm. is physical touch. Can you just help me? Like, yeah. could you just take this kid off me so they'll stop touching me and maybe do the dishes? So I think that there's that. And also during really stressful times of my life, um, someone just doing something like showing up and doing something for me would be the thing that would feel better than a hug. Mm-hmm. And that's just like, I don't know. It, it doesn't mean that those things aren't important to me. It just means that at that particular time or moment in my life, or maybe that person, the thing I really needed from them wasn't the thing that I feel like I need most of the time. So mm-hmm. I just think that's an interesting caveat. The other thing I will say is that different relationships are different. So my family or of origin, we are not physically touchy people. Um, my siblings and I maybe hug each other like once a year, maybe. Mm -hmm. And we hug each other's kids. It's just, we're not, we do not hug each other. I don't know why it's not. I do remember like a lot of like lip peck kissing happening with me, Mm -hmm. my, my mom and my sister and me when I was younger, but just that wasn't like a big part of our family culture. And so now it would feel almost like, I don't feel like I need to go in for a big hug with my siblings, even though I love them dearly. We just have other ways we show love to each other. So sometimes it's like relationship Mm -hmm. dependent. Sure. Too. So I don't really know how to like, I don't know, sum all that up, except to say it's, it's a framework that can be fluid, but the basic, um, me as a, as a person doesn't change. It's just like you adapt, I guess, or things change. Yeah. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. And as you were talking, I was thinking that the, the inverse is true, which is the way that you're able to give love to other people also goes in flux and in seasons. Um, I'm thinking about, so acts of service, because that's my primary love language, it's something I think about a lot. And an act of service can be really small. Um, I think of it as what could I do that I know this person really doesn't want to do. So Brian, for example, um, the way we divide up laundry, I do all of the laundry. I'm pretty much in charge of it. I keep it all moving. I fold almost all of it. I still fold the kids clothes. They put their own clothes away. Um, But Brian's laundry, I usually kind of toss on his side of the bed and he tends to fold it and put it away. But he hates folding socks like he just hates it. He hates matching them up. He hates. So an act of service that is genuinely appreciated is if I were to fold those socks, he can do it. He'll put them away. And that's part of his routine. And I do, you know, 97 percent of the laundry in this house. So certainly I'm already doing a lot. But because I know he doesn't like to fold socks, it's that little amount of service that makes a big that that shows a larger act of love. And I think the same can be true with as kids get older, you know, my older kids have more responsibilities. So I'm not going to do everything for them. I'm not going to pick up everything after them. But, um, you know, Allegra just got braces on and her teeth have been sore. So before we before I went in to record today and Brian had a lunch meeting, I said, let's put out let's put out a little bit of food that we know she can eat. Now, she's capable of getting her own lunch. She's doing school from home right now. But those types of acts of service were more I'm more I have more bandwidth for those types of little yeah. things than I did when my entire body life and waking hours were devoted to servicing it like helpless creatures. You know what I mean? Right. So, yes. The yes. point is, is uh, that was like a long, a long thing just about acts of service. But you can see how there was a season of my life where I would have had to really exert myself to find and execute an act of service because I was in such demand. I was already serving my children yes. like in so many ways. Whereas what in, extra could you yeah. do? Like you were keeping them alive, right. and, you know? And yeah. On top of that, they weren't going to appreciate it because they are they were right. helpless beings. But now at almost 13, Allegra will appreciate that act of service because she is capable of getting her own lunch and she didn't necessarily expect it. So I think as we move through this um, and I I think we'll see ways in which it's it's totally not one size fits all. But having the five in the back of your mind still can be really helpful. And and the last thing I was going to say about that is I think everybody can receive love in all five of these ways. So just I because, totally agree, just because yes. physical touch is lowest for me does not mean I'm a robot who does not like to hug, snuggle, you know, all of those things. So by ranking them, it makes it feel like the one on the bottom is like, you hate that. It's like your, your hate language or right. like, don't, <laughs> don't, don't ever do Don't that. give me a gift. Do, I'll throw it back in your face. Exactly. Yeah. So no, it's just simply like, it's sort of showing you the relative importance, but I think we can all feel love and, and give love in all of these ways. And I think the, the, when you read, I have not read the couple's book, but I did read the, the book about 
kids. And I think they're pretty clear that we that all five are important. Um, It's more about paying attention to the ways you naturally give love and the ways your kids or the people in your life um, like to receive it. So. Totally agree. And, and just on that point, um, I was going to dive into this more in um, the next section of the show, but like, I think sometimes with little kids, I could see how this would be very hard to, I don't want to say diagnose, but you know what I mean? Like with little kids, like what little kid doesn't love getting ice cream or a gift? Yeah. Like what little kid doesn't want to, you know, give you a little chubby baby armed hug. Like it's, it's kind of hard with little ones to really figure out they're all going to sort of be, they're going to just assume you're going to do all the service for them. Mm -hmm. They're going to assume you're going to spend quality time with them because that's what you do. Right. So like those things are just not really particularly appreciated because that's mom. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then words of affirmation, physical touch and gifts are all going to usually with most kids are going to be received pretty well. So it can be really hard when they're little to suss out which one matters the most. I think it's a developing thing that kind of happens over time. I agree. Um, And yeah. And, and there are like, I know the book has some, some ways of helping to figure out with older kids, how that works. And I'm going to talk a lot about in the next um, segment of the show, how with the older they get, sometimes the more hard you have to work as a mom to even force it on them, Mm -hmm. like (laughs) to force all the languages on them because Sometimes they don't even seem like they want any of it except gifts and acts of service, really. And yeah. so that can be that can be a little um, it just muddies the water mm-hmm. a bit, I guess. But it's still you're right. Like everybody wants a hug sometimes. Yeah. Or ben- like we all get an endorphin benefit from someone rubbing her back. Like that's not sure. That's universal. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's more this like way. And sometimes, like I also said, like if I make you something or do work really hard for you and it results in a gift, what is it? Is it a gift or an act of service? It's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's a little fluid, Yeah, but it's fun. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. I think as we, as we wrap up this segment, my, for me, my biggest takeaway is I love all the humans in my house, my spouse and my three kids and all the people I'm close to. I love them. I want to show them love. Um, I think we're, where it helps me to think about love language is if, if I'm feeling like I want to reconnect or if I just haven't, like if we haven't connected recently or, you know, been like, if if I'm, if I'm looking for that something extra, I want it to be with that person's primary love language, not with my default, the one that I default show. Does that make sense? So like if Brian and I have had a crazy week and we just haven't even like connected at all or sat down and talked or we've been bickery or whatever it is. When I think of like, what nice thing could I do? The love languages helps me reframe that in, and not do the thing that I would want done for me, which is right. an act of service. But for him, it probably would be, I'm trying to think offhand what I think his is. I think physical touch and quality time would be probably top two for Brian. Yeah. So um, that's, I think where it's most helpful. And I think that can work, whether it's a partner, a friend, like a family member or your kids is just like, it's, it's retraining the def your default because your default may be, may not be the thing that pushes them over the top in their love, in their love cup or whatever. Love it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to really dive into how this works with our kids, especially our older kids. So I'm excited. Sarah, last week, we really dug into our personal goal setting for this year. And I have to say our conversation about our sponsor, You Need a Budget, really inspired me to kick my personal finance planning up a notch. I've already been budgeting, but I've also been pretty basic about it. And I just think it's going to feel really good to maybe set some travel goals or other ambitious purchase goals for late 2021 or early 2022, and then be able to actually afford it. Like, wouldn't a cruise look good on me? Oh my gosh, Megan. Well, with your love of pools and poolside beverages, I really think you would love to go on a cruise. But in all seriousness, as drawn out as this pandemic has been, it really can't last forever. And at some point, people will be doing things again. I think it would be great to come out of the pandemic with a much better handle on household finances. So we're in a great position to, you know, enjoy ourselves a little when that happens. Yes. And that's where you need a budget can help. YNAB is there to help you make better choices with the money you have now and to make a plan for the money you'll have in the future. You aren't just looking back and kicking yourself for spending too much on groceries or whatever. You're taking action right now to make a spending plan that works in the future. It's all about deciding how you want to use your family's income so you can take control of your money. 
We are loving YNAB over here and would love for you to try it too. And we've got a great deal. You can try You Need a Budget free for 34 days, no credit card required at youneedabudget.com slash mom hour. 34 days gives you enough time to really see how YNAB works for you. And you can get started today, right in the middle of the month or any time. That's youneedabudget.com slash mom hour for a 34 day free trial of You Need a Budget. Megan, did you create any health or wellness goals for 2021? You know, no super specific resolutions or anything, but one thing I'm really trying to put into action in 2021 is this idea of tiny habits, like those little rituals that really can make a difference overall and that are worth celebrating and returning to even when we slip. Because we're always going to slip, but that's okay as long as we circle back to what's good for us, right? I love that. And taking a multivitamin from our sponsor, Ritual, is actually a tiny habit I've been doing for a while now and definitely plan to continue in 2021. Ritual is a clean, vegan-friendly multivitamin that's made with key nutrients in forms your body can actually use. They have a delayed-release formula, which makes them easier on your stomach, even if you're taking them first thing in the morning. And there's a little mint tab enclosed in each bottle to make them taste fresh, so there's no fishy aftertaste like you might have experienced with other omega oil supplements. So I fell off the multivitamin wagon a few times last year, but Ritual made it so easy just to get right back on. Everything from how easy they are to absorb right down to how pretty they look in the bottle, just being honest. Ritual delivers your multivitamins to your door every month with free shipping always. You can start, snooze, or cancel your subscription anytime. And if you don't love Ritual within the first month, they'll refund your first order. And we have a great deal for our listeners. We're going to help you get 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash the mom hour to start your ritual today. Again, that's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 10% off during your first three months. Okay. So here's the part where I admit that when we talked about doing this episode, I bought the five love languages book about raising kids. And she bought one for me too. What an act of service. Or was it a gift? That was an act of service (laughs) and a gift. (laughs) All in one. (laughs) Probably not the, not either of the ways that you wanted to be loved by me. Um, I didn't love the it. It felt a little bit like an assignment, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I I did not love the book. And I'm I'm just sharing that to be really honest. And and because I think it's important that we can have a lot of fun with this framework and the discussion. But I, I could just say I didn't I didn't love the book. I didn't love some of the assumptions it makes about 21st century family life. It felt a little bit narrow or a little um, dated in dated? some yeah. mm-hmm, in some ways, um, and also I actually expected more um, like not worksheets, but you know what I mean. You know how some books have lots of like here, take this quiz or think about this. More um, inter- interactive is not the right word I'm looking for, but more of like a practical um, approach application. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and really, it was it was quite a long, just written out parenting book. And it also went into some things that I wasn't really looking for with this particular book, things like discipline, things like, um, yeah. So anyway, I'm just, I'm just sharing that because I think we can, we can embrace parts of a framework like this and not the whole. And that is what I am choosing to do. So I love thinking about the five love languages, did not love the parenting book. Just my, can I, can I weigh in and say Mm -hmm. that my tolerance for any prescriptive relationship or parenting book is so low (laughs) That typically I just go to the shortest version, which is like the quiz, like the self-discovery tool or the tool and like the quick summary. And then I make it work for me. So I I think that maybe that's not the case for you. I know you really like to read things and like you really (laughs) like to delve in. And I'm kind of allergic to that in a lot of ways. So I skimmed the book and it seemed kind of like what I expected. But like I, um, my personality would already lend me toward not actually diving deep into something like that. So, and that's fine too. Like you, yeah. you can take it and use it however it works for you. Yes. Agreed. Well, the, the way we thought we'd structured the second half of the show, at first I was going to go like kid by kid. And I'm like, no, that's too personal with our kids and also yeah. not help, not helpful to the listener. But we do have between us, we have eight kids and there are five love languages. So I am sure we have a wide variety of kids who, you know, feel love expressed very differently. But I thought we'd go more by the love languages themselves and just yeah. offer any observations from within our homes on how we express that love language or how any of our kids receive it. So let's start with physical touch. Yeah. So again, and this is something that's going to come up a lot. I think that 
again, this is really something that is very hard to figure out when your kids are little. They don't start to naturally pull away from things. It's almost like some some of the ways I judge what they do need is by figuring out what they don't need mm. as much, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. And when they're little, they don't really do that. They don't really show you that as much or maybe it's just not as obvious. So I'll just say I was a really, really super duper affectionate mom physically to all of my kids when they were little. And I would say they were all super duper affectionate back to me, sometimes to a very cloying and annoying degree. <laughs> um, will has always been a, been a bit of an outlier there. And I will, you know, he's the one kid I'm going to call out in this section of the show. Um, I'm not gonna do it for everybody, but he just wasn't as touchy and snuggly as the rest. I mean, but even he loved a good cuddle up until about three or four or so he was the easiest to wean. He didn't seem that much like he cared, you know what I mean? But Mm -hmm. like, but like he still, he liked to snuggle. He just didn't really need it. And I will say physical touch is one of those things that it's much harder to stay really consistent about with older kids even if you kind of feel like they need it. And Mm -hmm. that's the thing, like they'll shy away from it the older they get, even if you know they need it. Mm -hmm. Um, Will and I are finally regularly hugging again. And by regular, I mean like once a month maybe (laughs) because he kept telling me from the age of like six on that he just doesn't hug. And I remember him telling me that and I was like, oh, that's weird, but okay. And finally I was like, man, I I just need to hug. Can I just do this for me? Mm -hmm. Like I need this. I do believe that kids don't always know what they need um, and will make them feel good. And in Mm -hmm. the teen years, their brains are scrambled eggs, essentially. So sometimes you just have to give it to them whether they think they want it or not. And I don't mean that in like a like a creepy, oppressive way. But like if blaming it on me, if me saying, will I really need a hug means I get a hug and I get to give him a hug and he and he goes for it. To me, that feels like a bit of a win, even though he's not seeking it out. I do feel there is a benefit. Yeah. And I don't know. That felt really rambly, but just like physical touch. Is really, I love hugging my kids. I love being super affectionate with my kids. And one of the hardest things about having bigger kids is how much they start to not want it. Yeah. And, and then how you figure out how to introduce it back after they've rejected it. Yeah. Well, you the, know? the book, I'm, I'm trying to remember some of the examples from the book, but the book gave some good examples of outside of hugging, snuggling, you know, kissing goodnight, that kind of thing. Um, things like brushing someone's hair when they're, you know, when they're younger, if they want you to, or, um, even a light touch on the arm or like touching, resting your hand on their shoulder while you're talking. Um, you know, little, like not little kids, but mid-aged kids, like elementary school kids will let you do things like kind of play with their fingers while you're talking or like kind of just mindlessly you're scratching their back. So yeah, I think there's probably lots of ways, but like you said, the, the boundaries become very different as kids get older. I will say in my house, I have noticed one kid in particular who is more craves, more physical contact than I expected in an older age. And because physical touch is not my love language, sometimes I am like, God, like stop leaning on me or like, standing so close to me or, you know, and I have to really like, I have to reframe that of like, oh, this kid really does take physical touch as love. So I have to be careful about, I can still set boundaries. If I don't want to be touched, I can still set that boundary, but if I'm okay with it and I can just set aside my annoyance, it probably feels like love to them. And then another kid who really kind of like shies away from big hugs younger than I thought. So yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it is really interesting to watch. And as a mom, our, you know, our primal instinct is to just like scoop up these little people and hold them yeah. until they physically will not let us anymore. So I like what you said of, it's almost like a breakaway first and then a reestablishing of like, what is the type of physical touch that feels good to both, you know, to both yeah. sides in this relationship. Yeah. And you're right that it can be small. And I do a lot of things like walking around behind the kids if they're busy doing something and ruffling their hair and mm-hmm. sometimes like, oh, mom, but like you can kind of tell when they like it. Yeah. You know, and it it reminded me when you were saying the thing about a kid leaning on you or like just wanting to be in your space. I think sometimes they might not recognize that as even you participating in it. <laughs> But you're allowing that it and it's grounding. I uh-huh. think there's something kind of grounding about leaning up against another human. Mm-hmm. It's just an interesting thing that 
we all do need. And, um, and maybe, and I don't know which kid this is. I could, I could guess, but I don't know for sure which kid you're talking about. It also might be like, if there's a kid who doesn't, um, ask for hugs or like, you know, your typical cuddly, Mm -hmm. maybe they just need to find another way to get that connection to that grounding. And they might, they might be kind of covert about it. Yeah. I want to say one more quick thing about physical touch. And this is not from the love languages book. It's from a book called um, playful parenting by Lawrence Cohen. It's a really good book. Um, And there's a lot in there about physical play with younger kids, including things like wrestling and, um, almost like what you think of like, like what puppies do things that don't feel like as, as moms don't look like super cozy physical touch, but actually are really, really neurologically good for younger kids. So I might link up that book. It's not specifically have anything to do with love languages, but it does speak to the way different kids are physical in different ways. And what looks like wrestling or almost like rough play is actually really grounding for a lot of uh, younger kids, especially. So if you have a, like a wild one, or if wrestling is yeah. happening in your house, I think it's cool to learn about what is happening neurologically. And it's, it's actually more positive than you think. So I love that. Well, should we talk about words of affirmation? I think you're yeah, so good at talking about words of affirmation, Megan. Oh my gosh. Thank <laughs> you so much, Sarah. I feel so loved. Um, okay. So I have to admit, I, I am in a family that uses words in a lot of non-affirming ways that can kind of, <laughs> that can kind of be affirming in their own way, right? But we do a lot of verbal sparring. We're sarcastic. We re-rib each other. Um, and that kind of family culture can make words of affirmation hard because especially with older kids, you can't be too earnest. If you're too earnest, you might be panned. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like you might just get mocked. But at the same, or they might, their BS meter gets tripped. Like that's the thing too. But like in some level, there needs to be that like just kind of eager, wholesome support too. And kids aren't going to ask for that as they get older. So I think one thing that I kind of ran up against in the late nineties or so, there was this like praise pushback movement. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Oh yeah, definitely. Like don't praise your kids because it's insincere and it doesn't tell them anything and it makes them, you know, special snowflakes or whatever. And I, I did internalize that to some degree because, because empty praise has always been something that makes me inherently suspicious, Mm -hmm. but sometimes you can take it too far when every single thing you want to say to your kids has to be run through some computer in your head about whether you've formulated your praise correctly. You know what I mean? It kills the the joy right out of it. It kills everything. (laughs) Like it, it kills all the spontaneity. It takes all the sincerity away. I don't want us to have to sit there and think about, you know, the 10, the top 10 ways I can praise my kids. That's effective versus just saying, I think you're great or like, good job. I mean, sometimes those phrases work. And I think that there's a, an overthinking of those things, um, that can happen. So Mm -hmm. I don't disagree that telling a kid they did a great job when they didn't is maybe if you just keep doing that over and over or telling them how awesome they are all the time, maybe could, you know, could start to like degrade the message, but I, I don't want to become so academic about it that I don't ever just tell them, I think they're great Mm -hmm. or, or like that. I think they did a good job. So I guess for me, I'm trying to be more intentional about sincere, authentic, affirming words but I have to kind of phrase it in a way that's not going to embarrass certain kids. Mm -hmm. Some of my kids won't care and they'll eat it with a spoon, no matter what it is, but certain other kids, they will be embarrassed or suspicious. It's hard. So, I I mean, what I put in the outline is this is hard, yo. It's just hard. Like you have really have to know your kid and what their tolerance level is for all this stuff. So in your house of five or there's not five in the house anymore, but five that you've raised. There's five to deal with, yes. Um, Are there some that, are there any you think really do feel extra gooey love when you, with words of affirmation? And keeping in mind, words of affirmation could just be verbally saying, I love you. It could be thank you for, it's really, I think any kind of verbal, it's not just praise and compliments, but any kind of verbal expression of um, I missed you. I love you. You know, when it's, when it's used in words. So do you, can you think of any kids who really do receive love that way? They all do. Here's the thing. <laughs> the message has to be tailored to the kid. Okay. You're so right about that. So like Clara wants to just be told she's loved. Uh-huh. Like if, if I tell her every day, I love you so much. You're so amazing. I love you so much. Like she can't, 
she's like, she, there's no, there's no off switch with her. There's not like, there's no overflow of that. Owen is very naturally cynical. And if I tell him, I think you're great at something and he doesn't feel like he has the chops to back that up, he thinks I'm lying. Mm-hmm. Like it's very different. And those are just two examples with Will. It's cute little things. Like I got him this notebook the last time I was at TJ Maxx, which was, it's been a long time. And I was like, you know how you're in the checkout aisle at TJ Maxx mm-hmm. and oh, have yeah. all that stuff. Oh yeah. And it says something like, I love you meowy much. It's got like two little cats on it. You're perfect. <laughs> I love you meowy much or something. I just, it's ridiculous. And I gave that to him and it, we've been like writing notes back and forth on it. And here's the thing. like. It's so silly, but I know that he likes that I gave that to him. Yeah. And now we write notes to each other on this like really corny, like over the top corny um, notebook. I also think that if he, if a friend of his saw that and knew I had given that to him, that would also be like a love language for him. It's like a very, it's complicated. That's, yeah. the, only, that's the only way I can put it. It's super complicated and so kid specific. Um I think that they all feel loved that way, but it, they would not all equally feel loved from the same way of doing it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, so I feel like for me, I like giving words of affirmation. It's definitely in my top two of my own love languages. And I am earnest as all get out. So where your house is, is sparry and sarcastic, um, I am just that earnest person who gives really sincere compliments. You are, by the way, you're really good at that. And I'm not just saying that to affirm you. Oh, thank you. Your compliments are really, really good. And they make me feel really, really good. Like when you say you're, you're just so good at something or other, I, I know that you feel it and you mean it and that matters. Right. But like, I'm also a sap. So, right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And you know, I feel the eye rolly a little bit of of my kids, but I also, they're younger and I've tried to create a family culture where, um, it's normal to be around the dinner table and be like, you know what? I just want to compliment Violet because she was really afraid to do that, to go to that class. And she went anyway. And so like, I, I just have Mm. a verbal of all the things I don't do as a mom. I do think that verbal affirmations and creating a family culture around like sincere compliments and like almost kind of a a culture of celebration of like when somebody's when somebody's gone through something hard especially of saying it out loud in words so now that's I I may sound like I'm patting myself on the back I have no idea if any of my kids receive love that way really um the the love languages book that I read um, did talk about like kids who say, I know my mommy and daddy love me because, and then when they fill in that blank, it's like, that's kind of their love language. So like, because my mom, you know, leaves me notes when she goes on a trip, actually, that's, yeah. I'm probably mixing up love languages now. I think that would still be verbal no, that affirmation. Would, I believe yeah. That like would be, leaving yeah. you a note. So, yeah. um, so in terms of how my kids receive it, I don't know that I have any one of them. I think they all like compliments, but I think I give them so intentionally and so thoughtfully yeah. that they are just they're just used to it, I they're guess. Just like, like, uh, yeah. It's yeah. like, okay, here we go again. So I can't think of a kid who I think that's their primary love language. It will, will it'll, I guess it'll remain to be seen. So, well, that reminds me of two things. First of all, um, and I can call her out because I don't think she listens to the show. Uh, Jenna, my sister-in-law's mom is one of those people who even now, like, you know, her kids are in their forties. Uh-huh. Um, and you know, and she, and I'm kind of like a second kid to her. You know uh-huh. what I mean? Like yeah. I just, it, and you know, when she's going to be around you, it's going to be a really sincere, <laughs> like, like you feel like you're locked in, like you, like the, like the eyeballs lock, like the beams, uh-huh. you know what I mean? And she's going to say something really, really sincere about you or how amazing she thinks something you do is. And I know her daughters both roll their eyes when they talk about her yeah. outside of her, like outside of earshot. However, they both also really love it. Like yeah. it's, and that happens the older kids get, the more there's like the eye roll, but also maybe for the teen years, the eye roll outweighs the, the appreciation uh-huh. for a, a moment, but the appreciation is still there. And we're not parenting for 15. If I was parenting my kids for the way they are at 15 or 16, <laughs> throw in the towel. I would just give them like a bunch of money and have them move out. Really? I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause that's what they think they want. Yeah. They don't want anything I have to offer. They have zero so, love languages. They are receiving they no, love in zero it's, ways. <laughs> it's kind of how it feels like sometimes like no matter what I do, it's not enough or it's not good. So 
okay, whatever. So that was one, one thought. And the other thing is I think one, if your kids are like elementary school aged, um, one really interesting tool. And, and this made me think of that when you said, um, the book said like my mommy and daddy make me feel loved when you can kind of comb through some of their school writings to mm-hmm. sort of play detective on this stuff mm-hmm. because, um, every elementary school aged kid who can write does some sort of, I am thankful for, yeah. uh, assignment every year and a mother's day and a father's day. Yep. Mm-hmm. assignment and they always have to write what they appreciate that's about people so in their family. True. That's so true. Yeah. And I have some of those hanging on my fridge right now that have been around for years. Yeah. But if I went through and combed them, I'd be like, oh yeah. Yes. I'm yep. just remembering a Mother's Day one where Reed was probably in second, second or third grade. And um, he said, I like it when my mom and he wrote meditates with me, which is so mm. funny because I don't meditate. But at the time he'd been having bedtime anxiety and we'd been listening to the calm like a little kid meditation and so that would probably be quality quality time time. yeah Yeah. and but that's just that just popped into my head when you were when you were saying that um another way I think we're gonna talk about we're gonna move into the other love languages but another little clue when kids are younger I think is also what they do for their friends and their siblings and their cousins when it's time to like make a gift or make a card or um, I mean, I have Violet because this, I will just call her out. She is a gift giver. She will go into her room and find some little scrap of paper and wrap up her own possessions and just oh present you with, with a bag of, and she writes effusive notes. And so she, she's definitely like a love giver. She's a love taker too, but she's like, she's ultra. <laughs> Sometimes but, the best takers are the best givers. You so know? I really think gifts will probably end up being very high for her. And the reason, uh, the reason I know that is because she's a, a natural gift giver. If I just looked at receiving, you said it earlier, all kids like to receive gifts. That's a little right. hard to discern, but she is a very intentional gift giver at a very young age. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if that emerges as one of her top ones. So that's another little clue. I loved what you said yeah. about the, the school writing. Um, but another one would be how, like when, when a kid wants to do something nice, just organically, what do they do? Do they draw a picture? Do they, you know, I think it's just interesting. I love that. That is, that is a great tool. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about quality time. Another hard one with young kids, because if you're listening to this and you have small children, of course (laughs) they want quality time with you and you are giving it to them because that is what we do. But Megan, how has this played out in your house? So I've noticed, here's another thing, like the way we talked about, um, words of affirmation and physical touch, there being multiple ways to show that. Mm -hmm. I, I think I've noticed all my kids ask for this for quality time in their own ways, but some of them are kind of like sneaky about it and it's easy to miss. So like your kids are not always going to come up to like, come up to you and be like, mother dear, I would like to enjoy a shared hobby. Yeah. Right. That's not how this works. Right. Sometimes it's that they choose the one moment when I am paying attention to my computer more than I'm paying attention to the kids. Mm -hmm. And they walk in and want to share a story from school Mm -hmm. and they really want me to listen Mm -hmm. or they kind of like tiptoe sideways up to it. Like they want to go with me somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think maybe they just want to get out of the house. So they want to go to the store because they want me to buy them something, but actually they want the time with me. Right. And and maybe they don't even know. Like Mm -hmm. that's the thing too, that that's a really tricky thing about all this as well. We don't always know our true motivations for why we, ask for or position ourselves to get something. Mm -hmm. And we certainly can't expect our kids to know. Right. Like if we don't even always know, we can't expect them to know. So I think quality time is one of those things that should be really, really easy with older kids because it's so cut and dried. It's Mm -hmm. like even your, you know, crappy 15 year old will make like cookies with you Mm -hmm. if you ask, but maybe that's not the quality time they want. And they might they might come to you at very inconvenient times or they might want to tell you a really boring story yes. from school oh my gosh. Yeah. or they might want to talk to you about some drama in their class or they might, w- you know, there's like, oh, they might want to like recount. They might be eight years old and they want to recount the entire plot of a movie. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that for them, you engaging in that is quality time for them. And that is what I think is the hardest thing. I agree about this one in particular. I I agree because I think the way we think about quality time with our children is so different than the way we think about quality time with other adults. So if you had a friend 
who you know their primary love language is quality time, then making sure to make a date for a walk and keep that date and not cancel on them and show up and go for a walk is such a, it's a very clear way to fill that friend's quality time love bucket. But with children, first of all, we are already around them a lot and they need a lot from us, but you're right. They're the way they feel love and quality time, I think is exactly the way you described it, which is undivided attention on what is probably mind numbingly boring to you as a mom. And that is like a bummer. Of course, it's a bummer. (laughs) I'm so sorry to have to break this to you, but if that matters to your kid, you're going to have a lot of that. Yeah. And that's okay because if we're talking about a way of showing love, you don't have to do it every time they ask. You don't have to do it every second of every day, but knowing that that feels like love to them it might sh- it might be just enough to make it tolerable for you and i yeah. do think i think um eye contact and uninterrupted conversation for both for adults and for kids do feel like quality time and those things take they take time duh yeah. and they take practice in a way and almost like finding a rhythm i'll just share openly that my spouse who's one of the, his love languages is quality time will sometimes walk into a room and start in like start almost mid topic in something that's going on at work. And this is a pandemic Mm. problem. I'm sure other people are having this pandemic struggle as well with everything working, everyone working from home. But I, in my mind, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I, first of all, like, am I supposed to know what he's talking about? Like, is it like, (laughs) did I miss the first half of this conversation? Second of all, we're only past, we're basically passing in the hallway. Like, do we even have time for this? What I need to read that as is a, like an outreach for connection. Like if we haven't yeah. made time to have a longer discussion about what's going on at work and, and then I'm getting these like these little, these passes, these like attempts midstream, it's like, oh, okay. I can identify this probably as an area, area that could use some devoted quality time. And our kids are like that too. Like you said, they'll just wander into a room and kind of demand our attention in a very odd way. And I think all of that, all of that is asking for quality time. Um, yes, I, I completely agree. I don't know if you, I think you do probably have one kid who's like this, but I have one kid who just does not like to be alone ever. Mm-hmm. And you can all guess that that is Violet and she would admit it, but she Mine doesn't, be Clara. she doesn't, although she's gotten much better as she's gotten older, but when she was little, she was my mini me, my oh shadow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, and Violet will, she, we have this, our house is really spread out now and it's bigger than our old house. So she doesn't even like to be on one end of the house by herself. She will follow whoever to the other end of the house. Um, and that is also kind of hard to parse quality time because it can feel like you are always together. Right. So I guess we've kind of gone on here about quality time, but I think the point is with your children and as your children get older, it's worth really thinking about what would, how would this individual really truly perceive quality time? Is it doing an activity together like Mm -hmm. art or, you know, going out and like hitting golf balls together? Cause for some more active kids, it may need to be like a thing that you do. And for others, it might be just just listening or just like listening to their music that you hate, but doing that together and kind of sucking it up. So, yeah. And I I also say, and I think it's really funny that Brian, um, (laughs) that he has that because both my ex-husband who I finally learned to just put my computer or phone aside and listen. Um, and my new special man friend (laughs) had that habit of just like starting mid story launching it. I have no idea who they're talking about. They're bringing up names of people I've never heard of. And I don't know if it's a mom thing or just like a, uh, you know, like a busy woman thing, but I'm like, can we cut to the chase? How can I help you, dear? Like what, what, what information do you need for me? And that's not the point, right? Like, I don't have to know who any of the players are in this story. I don't have to have any advice, which is funny because isn't that what they say women do? I don't know. Like I, I don't do that. I don't bring home my problems from, well, I am already at home. Anyway, I don't bring my real, my problems or my petty annoyances from work into my relationships. I truly don't like you and I work it out together, right. which is the nice thing about being business partners and friends. Like by the time I get to the end of the day, I don't really need to talk about it right. I with agree. anybody. Yeah. Right. I've already, I've already dealt with all that. I want to talk about something else, but I've, I have noticed that, um, several of the men and men, man, children uh-huh. in my life 
are very different and they just want to talk things through. And I would say Owen is the one of mine who is like that as my kid, like Mm. the one who just wants to kind of follow me around and just say obvious things. Yes. Or Mm -hmm. talk about things I have no way of chiming in on because I don't know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And it also reminds me of when he was really little and he would ask me to scratch his back, which you would think is a physical touch Mm -hmm. love language. But while I was scratching his back, if I was like doing anything with one other hand, he'd say both hands. Oh, he wanted all of you. Like he wanted all of He wanted to know that you were completely focused on him. Interesting. Which is really a quality time thing. Yeah. And the nice thing is when you finally just put away the other distractions, it, it doesn't take much time. Yeah. Yeah. Like 20 minutes of um, distracted time is like equal to two minutes of completely focused uh-huh. time. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I think this is one of those things again, just to reiterate our point that it can sometimes look like one thing and it's actually another thing, but knowing like taking the time to suss out really what's actually happening can kind of help you get there quicker, Mm -hmm. you know? And, and also women are not always the ones who run our mouths off. That's the other thing. I just want to say, like, I just feel like that's like such a stereotype that, um, that that's more of like a lady thing. And I, in my experience, that is so not me. I agree. I'm not a verbal person processor at all. But I know women in my, I mean, I guess we are verbal processors. We have a podcast and we talk to each other, but, but, um, as a way to connect with my loved ones, it's not, that's not usually my love language of quality time is conversation for me. Not usually. Um, should we talk about acts of service? My favorite of the love languages favorite. I'll let, I'll turn this over to you. Cause I kind of said earlier, that again, this is so hard when kids are little, but as kids get older, I I find it kind of fun. And I know that's because it's my love language. Yeah. And Sarah, this is one of those that I am the, this is probably the one I'm best at consistently giving to all my kids um, because it is fun. It's so fun to do things for people. And I, I mean, I wouldn't even say acts of service, like, even though I know it's in my top four, <laughs> like, what does that mean? Right? Like, yeah unless I'm in a true time of need where I really am very stressed or very overwhelmed, I don't really notice if people do things for me or not so much, but I love doing things for people and it's easy. Everybody likes to have things done for them. So Mm -hmm. a teenager who doesn't want your hugs and doesn't want to hang out with you and maybe doesn't really care, doesn't seem to care about some of the other ones They're always going to, I imagine, at least in my head, even if they don't actually say they appreciate it, if I hand them a stack of clean laundry, how could they not appreciate that? Like, even if they don't say so, I know it matters to them. Um, Making Clara and Owen a cup of tea in the morning, like I'd like to do, even though they can do it themselves. Um, Things like that makes me feel really good. Mm -hmm. So I'm good at doing that, which does make me think sometimes there's that little voice in the back of my head going, okay, do I do too much? my overdoing for my older people. Um, very possible. Like if I have a feeling as a mom, it's probably that I do too much for my kids in certain ways. Um, although I don't think I coddle them. I just like to surprise them. I just Mm -hmm. like to do things, nice things for them. It makes me feel in some ways that same feeling I had that I like to lean back on when they were really little and Mm -hmm. I did everything for them. Mm -hmm. It's like that nurturing feeling. Yeah. So I don't really know that I have much to say about how my kids respond because I think most kids don't respond to acts of service from their mother. Right. (laughs) That is true. Because they just expect it. Yeah, I think that's so true. Although this one's interesting because it is so my dominant primary love language for myself that I think it is also useful to help your kids know what feels like love to you. And I think you have to be a little careful with this because I don't I don't suggest telling little kids like, if you really loved me, you'd put away your laundry. Like that's, <laughs> right, that's right. not what I mean. But, a little manipulative perhaps. Yes. But I do, um, I, I am not against kind of sharing with the people in your house. Like, gosh, when you did that the first time without being, you know, told a million times, that is, a, that's truly an act of service for me. Like I notice that and it feels good to me. Thank you. So I think you can, there I am giving words of affirmation for my children speaking my love language, I guess. But I, I don't think it's a, bad thing to make your love language known and to make the people in your house realize that like 
acts of service, if acts of service are your, the way you like to be loved, then it's hard as a mom because people, no one in your house is probably, you know, doing acts of service as much as you would like them to do. Cause that's yes. kind of the dynamic of home life. So in the dynamic of moms, mom has this sort of like, uh, like we're both, we talk about the fact that we set the tone for our households. We are the Mrs. Hughes. Mm -hmm. We are the active managers. We've done, we've created ourselves the overlords yes. of our homes. I don't know that it would occur to anyone that it might feel good for mom to have things done for her. Like, yeah. I, unless we say it. Yeah. They see us as like all, like all powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sort of like unstoppable. And I, I think that's awesome. But I think that's why moms kind of get put up on this pedestal sometimes that's like a, like a useless pedestal yeah. to be on, you know, <laughs> right. but that I think is the dynamic we sometimes set up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess the, the, to put a bow on acts of service, um, if it is a love language for you or anyone in your home, then I guess the point is to recognize that and maybe to be creative because in a domestic environment, we're all doing act quote unquote acts of service all the time. I'm making lunches for my kids. The kids are folding their laundry and putting it away. Part of it yeah. is just keeping a household running. So to show it as an act of love, I think requires a little bit more creativity and a little bit more like something a little unexpected maybe is the point. If, if that's the way you're trying to show love. So yeah, yeah. that's a good way to put it. Should we talk about gifts? Yeah. Okay. So as I told you already, gifts are really low on my, um, love language meter. And this is actually one that I learned from reading this and I think I've shared this maybe before on this podcast, but like um, when I was married, my ex would often pick me stuff up at the store and bring it in. I'd be like, oh, thanks. Cool. Whatever. You know, I didn't care. And then he would be like offended when I would go to the store and not bring him things. And I didn't get it until I became aware of the love languages um, framework. And that made a lot of sense to me. Like that was one way that he was really, he would receive love. And I didn't care. So it didn't occur to me. So that was actually one of the ones that I thought it was so striking to me that that was like my lowest low on the, on the list. And it was probably his number one on the list. And I think that was very educational for me mm -hmm. with kids. It's harder as we've established. No kid hates gifts. <laughs> I don't know a single one. Um, and also there's something about being a mom. Um, like I do go all out with gifts at Christmas, birthdays are more scaled back. And the rest of the year, we don't really just do gifts. However, I really like to do nice little things for my kids. And it might be something like pick up donuts for breakfast or get chocolate milk when I'm at the store or ice cream just because I want to. And I remember very distinctly when Jacob and Isaac were really small, like three and one or something, when I realized my power of giving happiness as a mom and how I could go to the store and buy like a little toy for a couple of dollars and bring it home and how happy that would make them. And that made me like a big kind of surprise gift giver when my kids were really little because it felt like a superpower mm -hmm. that I didn't realize that I had and had never had. Like I had never had that power. And suddenly there's these small people at home that I can make so, so happy just by bringing them like a trinket. So I just, I guess for me, the, the takeaway from that is it made it really hard for me to actually figure out or diagnose or whatever that love language in any of my kids, because I haven't really quite figured out which of them loved it because they just like stuff mm -hmm. and which of them loved it because they like, it made them feel loved. Mm -hmm. Those yeah. are two very different things. And I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I'm still working this one out. And I, I don't know that any of my kids truly are have a, have gifts as their number one love language but i have two in mind who i think it ranks up there yeah pretty high yeah interesting um so i already talked about violet i do think that this is an emerging love language for her in part because she likes to give gifts and yeah. she likes the ceremony and the yes. ritual and the wrapping and i think that was in the love languages book as well that i read that kids who just sort of savor the experience of even, even just like you said, bringing home something from the drugstore or like a food gift, like picking up donuts or something um, that all kids will enjoy them. But some kids will just their whole 
face and their whole body lights up at the surprise element or the unexpected or the opening, the wrapping, the ribbon. So yeah, I do think it's obviously harder to suss out when kids are younger, but I definitely think I have a, a gifts love language person in my house. I wanted to speak to this actually being difficult for me as a gift giver because I, um, I mean, we just, we wrapped up the holidays not too long ago and we've done a million episodes about you know, shopping and, and our gift giving style. But I sometimes lack the, I am so pragmatic and so practical and such an acts of service oriented person that some parts of gift giving and receiving feel frivolous to me. And I, Mm. I'm like embarrassed to even (laughs) say that, but like, I can sometimes see a bag of tissue paper and wrapping and think, Oh gosh, we're just, it's just going to make a mess. We're gonna have to throw that away. You know? And it's like, that is, I, I'm embarrassed to say that, but so I guess I come at gifts as a love language, admitting that it's really not mine and it makes it harder for me to give gifts as a love language. It's not hard for me to give Christmas and birthday gifts. That's fine. It goes on a checklist and I get it done. But especially when it gets down to the joy of shopping and preparing and wrapping and Like all of, I think people whose love languages are gifts really enjoy that ritual aspect of it. And they're really good at things like wrapping paper and cards and just presenting the whole thing. Even today, I had to drop off um, some gratitude gifts for the kids' school for something they're doing. And I just, I am unendingly grateful and I'm really good at writing words of affirmation in a card. But something about the putting together of the bags was not enjoyable to me. It didn't feel like a love language to me. It felt like something else. So I I guess I'm sharing that in case anyone else relates and that it doesn't mean you can't be a good gift giver or you can't love the people in your life for whom gifts are their love language, but it doesn't come naturally to me. Like I have a whole bunch of like things working against me. I just think it's funny because I also, you know, as I already said, gifts are very low on my list, but I do like to give gifts. I just think for me, gifts and acts of service are almost one and the same sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because when I really find something I love, like I don't love giving obligatory gifts. I don't like giving gifts just for the sake of giving it. When I choose a gift for someone, I want them to feel that I've done something for them specifically, Mm. which almost feels a little bit different. It's This is where it gets a little muddy, right? Mm -hmm. So where one category can kind of go into the other, but where, where you're saying, you know, like it feels to you like a kind of frivolous or a waste. It's not exactly like that for me, but it's more like, do I have to just do this thing just to check it off a list? I mean, (laughs) it doesn't jive with the way I like to gift give. And I think that's because I want gifts to feel like they were picked out Mm -hmm. with like someone's true personhood in mind. And, um, that's not a good way to do a shopping list at Christmas time. I'll tell no, you that much. <laughs> it is not. It takes a little extra time. Yeah. And it means you'll get very overwhelmed. So, well, yeah. I, I wanted to add too that if you have really little kids who maybe it seems like they just delight in gifts, I don't think you need to think about spoiling or, or going to the Target dollar store every time. The book, um, the Love Languages book gives cute ideas about things like if you're out on a walk coming home with like a pretty rock or a leaf or something yeah. that, you're just like, look what I found. I brought this for you. And, um, you know, drawing like doodling hearts on a piece of paper and, and handing it to your preschooler be like, I made you a picture. Like the act of giving is, can be very, very, very simple. And I think we go, us adults go right to the more traditional gift giving. But if it's a kid we're talking about, then they, you know, they can take the, I, that idea at a much simpler level. And, and you might find that you have a kid who just really loves that, like the excitement of like, Oh, I, you know, I, I drew this for you. And it's like, I a, love that on a post-it note. Well, it, that reminds me of Clara who I do just to spoiler alert. Um, I mentioned earlier, I have two kids who I think might have gifts as a love language and Clara's one. And it does not matter what I bring her. She's delighted mm-hmm. like anything. It could be the dumbest thing. And if I bring it to her, the reaction I get from her shows me how much she just loves being thought of in that way. And she's the only kid of mine who's ever requested I I write her notes in her lunchbox. Oh, that's like really she, cute. Like I've done it for all my kids on and off, but usually they don't really seem to care that much. And she actually said to me at one point, mom, like when you gave me that note in my lunchbox, I really liked it. And I know you like to do it as a surprise. So I'm not going to tell you when to do it, but I just want you to know. And she was like in third or fourth grade. I love so that. So it's not like she was 
older. I mean, she was pretty young to be that self-aware, but I thought that was really cute. And, and there, and then I had to find a way to make it still feel spontaneous and fun for both of us, but also to give her exactly what she was asking for, because she was very explicit about what she wanted. She was clear in that, in that sense. Another thing you can do too, for kids who really love gifts, and I have definitely done this, is something you're getting them anyway that they need, um, but presenting it in a way that feels a little gifty. So Reed just needed some new shirts and I got him on Amazon for like zero dollars. He wears these really inexpensive, like athletic style t-shirts and I got him the next size up, but his, I don't think his love language is, is gifts and I didn't do this, but if I'd been giving that to one of my other kids... I might have said, like, close your eyes and put out your hands. I have something for you, you know, or like yeah, put it yeah. on their pillow or, you know, present it in such a way that it feels like you thought of them. And in this case, it's also an act of service because he's outgrowing his shirts. And I noticed and I, you know, went through the process of shopping. So, again, our, our lines are blurred here. But sometimes I think with all of these love languages, the presentation of the thing you're going to do anyway, whether that's quality time or a hug or, or a gift, the, the intentional presentation of it can be like amplified a teeny bit for the kid who really loves that love language, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Totally agree. All right. Well, um, I think it's time to wrap up. We will in the show notes link to a bunch of things because some of you may want to check out the book or go to the website and take the quiz or take it with your partner. Um, I'm sure we will have a lively discussion in the Facebook group about this, because this is the type of thing that people love to, you know, compare notes about. So we'll link to our Facebook group and definitely join us over there. Can I make a a, a note really quick that I have just been so happy with our Facebook group lately? I I know we've talked about this a few times. It's just, it's a really quality place. I don't know how else to put it. Everyone is like super supportive and great. And I'm genuinely, like genuinely enjoying the conversations happening there. So I agree. If you're not in there yet, come on. Well, Whatever. yeah. And it's almost like when you listen to the podcast, it's just you, it's, it's Megan and Sarah and you out there listening, but this is like a conduit to the other people who are listening. And yet the conversations are not just about the podcast at all. It's people supporting each other through all kinds of different parenting challenges and all with the same kind of inclusivity and just like non-judgment that we try to have here on the show. So I agree. I, I'm just completely kind of humbled by what's happening over there. And if you request to join, just answer the three little questions. We're trying to keep the group to, it's not an exclusive group. Anyone who listens to the show can be in the group as long as you, you know, kind of uphold those same, those same values that we do. Right. But if you don't answer the questions, we don't know if you're, if you even know what the mom hour is. And you might have just fallen yeah. in. Yeah. You yeah, fell exactly. into a hole and landed in <laughs> <Yeah>. our group. <laughs> yeah, so no, we, we just, we, uh, we want it to be a place where everybody has this podcast in common as their common thread. Um, not because it's all about us, but because it keeps the conversation kind of focused. So answer those questions. Cause sometimes I see people who don't and I'm like, well, but I, I don't, there's plenty of motherhood groups on Facebook for you. If that's what you're looking for this one, this one is for our people. So, all right. Yeah. Well, we will be back with you this coming Sunday. We have a more than mom episode, our first of the year, and we're going to be talking Yay. about where to put stuff, right? Megan, the, the last yes. in that series. So that'll be fun. <sighs> and um, yeah, we'll be back in your ears this Sunday and we'll talk to you then. Talk to you then. Talk to you then.